We find our text this morning from Colossians chapter 1. We'll continue our reading at verse 21 uh, through to the end of verse 23. So Colossians 1, 21 through 23 will be our text for this morning. Paul writes to the believers in Colossae, he says, Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel, this is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. Brothers, sisters of our Lord Jesus Christ. When we look at the letter that Paul wrote to the believers in the city of Colossae, notice that the Apostle Paul is stressing there the importance of the Lord Jesus for the life of the believers in that place. Paul stresses already in chapter 1 that the Lord Jesus is really the central figure in the whole world. And because the Lord Jesus is the central figure in, in, in the universe, therefore he should also be the central figure in their life. And so you read in the first part of this chapter how Paul writes that the Lord Jesus is the one who has created the world. And that the whole world, therefore, that in fact the whole universe depends on the Lord Jesus for everything. The world cannot exist without the Lord Jesus. But as important as the Lord Jesus is with regard to the creation of the world, this is the same Lord who has now come to the world as the Savior. In order that he might create in this world a, a new people, a church that will belong to the Lord God. And so Paul then points out in our text this morning that what has happened in this world is that after God has created the world and created mankind, mankind has become alienated from, from God the Creator. So that mankind now refuses to acknowledge God as their God who has made them. But he says, but remember the Lord Jesus now came to the world so that he might restore mankind again to a living relationship with God. Christ came that he might restore the peace that was broken in the relationship between God and mankind. Well, it's a relationship that mankind has broken because they have rebelled against the Lord. But, but Christ, Paul says, came as the great peacemaker so that he might again bring that relationship back together. And he has done that by giving his life as a sacrifice on the cross. And so in this letter, Paul then reminds the believers about the great saving work of the Lord Jesus. And he warns them, and he also encourages them, and he says, and therefore, don't let, get, let go of the great hope of salvation that you have in the Lord Jesus, your Savior. And so this morning I may proclaim to you God's word under this theme. We'll look at Christ's work of reconciliation. Our theme then is Christ's work of reconciliation. We look at three things. We look at our past which we're alienated from God. Secondly, we look at our present, in which we are now reconciled with God. And thirdly, we look at our future. We look at then for a glorious hope. <clears throat> well, Paul begins the text by writing these words. He says, once you were alienated from God. Once refers to a time somewhere in the believer's past life, in the believer's past. In order to, to understand uh, where they are today, Paul says, you need to understand where you have come from. He says, when you look at your own life and you look to the past, do you remember that there was a time when you were alienated, that is, that you were, that you were separated, that you were, uh, that you were estranged from God? And of course, when there is an alienation in a relationship, that means that there is a separation between two parties. And whenever there is separation between two parties, 
there you also have hostility that exists. And so Paul then recalls uh, a time when that sinful situation existed in uh, these people's relationship with the Lord God. He says, remember there was a time when you were estranged from the Almighty One. But Paul also makes it very clear. He says, and you, you need to understand too that that situation wasn't God's fault. God never became unfaithful to you. God never became unfaithful to mankind. But it was a result of our own human guilt and our own human hostility towards him. And so Paul here is actually taking us back uh, to the beginning uh, with our first parents, Adam and Eve. And so he recalls how, uh, and also I know he doesn't speak about it, but yet we need to think back to how God created mankind in the beginning. He made us perfect. He created us without any sin. God in paradise also revealed his perfect love for Adam and Eve. But what did they do with God's love? What did they do with God's faithfulness? Or rather than honoring God, rather than serving God faithfully, no, they turned against the Lord God in rebellion. And by falling into sin, they now estrange themselves from the Lord God of heaven. Well, the fact that mankind is is to blame for this state of alienation comes out loud and clear in the words of the Apostle Paul when he writes this. He says, you were enemies of God in your minds because of your evil behavior. Enemies in your mind speaks about uh, the way that they were thinking about the Lord God uh, there in their mind. Paul says, remember how in the past the attitude of your mind was an attitude of hostility. That this hostility against God is a determined, self-sustained attitude of mankind against the Almighty. It means that human beings are determined to oppose God because of their rejection of Him, because they don't want to serve Him. Remember Paul wrote about that hostile attitude in his letter to the Romans. In chapter 1, verse 21, he writes these words. He says, for although they, that is mankind... Although mankind knew God, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him. But their thinking, their thinking became futile. So you notice what he says. He says, even though mankind knew God, yet they rejected the idea that they were somehow creatures who were made by God. So that instead of giving glory to their Creator, no human being sought satisfaction in their life by living in complete ignorance of God. And when people act like God does not exist, when they act as if there is no God in the universe, uh, then they will act and they will live as if they themselves are God. And if you become God in your own eyes, that means that you think that you can also determine for yourself how you are going to live. And so Paul reminds the believers, he says, remember how that was the attitude in your mind at one time in your life? Remember how there was a time when you were arrogant, when you were full of pride, uh, when you thought that you could go on your own and you could decide for yourself what was right and wrong and how you wanted to live? Remember how there was a time that you were hostile to the Almighty God of heaven and earth? And when you think of that attitude, beloved, that also may help us to explain and understand why today in our society that you find so much hostility against the Christian religion. Why there is so much hatred against the moral teachings of, of God when we even raise them. Why? Because people do not want to hear about the will of God. And why don't they want to hear about the will of God? Because they don't want to submit to God's will. Because they want to follow their own will. And so what we have is a situation today where we're, people in our society, they will tolerate every immoral practice, but they will not tolerate anyone who reminds them about the will of the Almighty God, the creator of heaven and earth. We live in a time, beloved, in which you can say that God's will must be sacrificed for the sinful attitude that mankind has. And that hostility then also makes it very clear that people aren't ignorant of God. Because when they're confronted with God's will, they act with hostility. 
They desire, you can say, with their whole heart to live in ignorance of God. Well, not only were they enemies of God in their minds, but Paul also points out, he says, their hostile attitude also results in uh, their evil behavior. Notice the footnote in your Bible, in your New Bible, in verse 21, in a way makes clear what Paul is really saying here. This verse then reads like this, if you follow the, the footnote, once you were enemies of God in your minds, as shown by your evil behavior, as shown by your evil behavior. And so Paul's point is that a hostile attitude against God leads to an evil, it leads to a wicked behavior. But here again, remember Romans chapter 1, verse 21. Paul there also wrote that when mankind decided to, to live in ignorance of God, the result is what? The result, he says, is that they became fools. And therefore God in his judgment, what did God do in his judgment? Well, he gave them over, Paul says, to the sinful desires of their hearts. And so you see, a hostile mind against God, Paul says, always leads to great wickedness in the life of mankind. And again, you, you can see how that principle is being worked out in our own society even today. You see, like, the more that people live in that willful ignorance of God, the more they promote immorality and wickedness. And so what you see in our society today is simply the natural result of people's rejection of God. But now, of course, we can point our finger at our society. We look at all the terrible things that are happening all around us. But we need to keep in mind, beloved, that Paul writes this not for the people in our society in the first place. But he's writing this as a, a warning you know, to the believers there in the church in Colossae. Although we don't know anymore what the exact danger was or the exact heresy was that uh, Paul had to write against here in this congregation, the fact that, that Paul reminds them about their old way of life when they're still unbelieving indicates that there was an, a real danger that these believers were going to go fall back again to that old way of life as, as if they were giving up their Christian faith and, and going back to that old way. And so Paul says, he says, remember where you came from? Remember how once you were alienated from God? Well, you know, you never want to go back to that old way of life again, do you? And so, hold on. Hold firm to the hope of salvation that the Lord God has given you. Now, beloved, to, today for, for many of us, you know, we, I think most of us, the majority, have, we've grown up as children in, in the knowledge of the Lord God. We've gone to church. We've heard the preaching every, every Sunday. We've gone to catechism, and we've learned about the Scriptures and about the Bible. And so perhaps there are some uh, among us who, who can relate to, to what Paul writes here more than, uh, than to others in the sense that we have different backgrounds. But the warning is very clear. As God's people, Paul says this, he says, you never want to go back to that life in which we were alienated from God who is our creator. Because to be alienated from the Lord God, to be separated from your creator, means that you live without any hope here in this life. So Paul says, he says, don't go back there again. No, to go back to that life of ignorance in which you once lived under the wrath and the judgment of God. You don't want to go there. I cling, my brothers, my sisters, he says, he says, cling to the glorious hope that you have in God. Remember how you received that glorious knowledge of God so that now you believe in the Lord Jesus as your Lord. You know him to be your Savior. Remember that he is the one who, who didn't only create you, but he's also the one who has now come and renewed your knowledge and your understanding about the Almighty God. Remember how in the Lord Jesus Christ you now have this hope of the forgiveness of your sins and you now have this hope of the life everlasting. Don't let go of that, my brothers, my sisters. Hold on to what the Lord has given to you today. And then you may ask, well, what is it that the Lord God has given you? 
Paul writes in verse 22. He says, now he has reconciled you, that is God, has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. <clears throat> Basically what Paul says in verse 20, 22, he says, this is where you are now. And where you are now, you are now reconciled with God. You see, earlier in this chapter, Paul has been writing about the supremacy of the Lord Jesus Christ. He wrote about how the Lord Jesus has created everything in the world, that the Lord Jesus is the one who's bringing about also a new creation in the life of his own people. He writes how Christ is reconciling the world with the Lord God. But the question that Paul answers for the believers in this letter is where they now fit into that scheme of Christ's redeeming and Christ's reconciling work. He says, remember how in that scheme of the work of the Lord Jesus in which he came to, to save the world, he says, remember how you were lost in the world. And now where the Lord God placed you, Christ has now placed you here as his people who are now reconciled with God. And so Paul reminds him, he says, remember where God has now placed you in this world. And don't forget that. And I'm sure that Many of you might be able to also relate to the experience that you may have had when sometimes you enter into a, a large shopping mall and you're not too familiar with that shopping mall. And you walk in and immediately you will feel a sense of being lost and you know idea of where you need to go. And so what the first thing that you do is you go and you, you look for one of those maps uh, of the mall that are located uh, near you know, the entrances. And when you go to the map of that mall, uh, then at first you're still confused. You just can't orientate yourself to that map because you can't figure out where, where, you, where you need to go. And so what do we do when we look at that, at that map? Well, if we look for that little arrow uh, that points to an X that says, you are here. And once you know where you are on that map, uh, the map begins to make sense, and you can begin to figure out where you are going or where you want to go. And in a sense, you can say that is what Paul is, is doing for the believers here in Colossae in this letter. He says, the Lord Jesus is working to reconcile the world with God. And here you are in that great plan of Christ's salvation. He says, remember, once you were alienated from God so that you did not, uh, so you did not have a place among those who, who were redeemed by God. But that's changed. Because now, here you are. You've been reconciled by the Lord. God has given to you a place among his redeemed in this world. And so Paul then also shows them where you can say where they are on the map of Christ's work of salvation. Because what happened is, it appears that they were losing sight of where they were in their spiritual life. Right? They're in danger of going back to that old way of life. And so Paul reminds them, he says, this is where you are. You are God's people, redeemed by Christ, now reconciled with the Lord. And once they can again see where they are on that map of salvation that they are people reconciled by Christ, they can again also see where they are going. Paul writes in verse 22, he says, Now God has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. Paul says, he says you know the goal of Christ's work? For you as believers, reconciled by his blood, is that he might present you to God holy, without blemish, and free from accusation. And so Paul says, this is where you are. Reconciled by God. How? By Christ's physical body through death. And then see where, you, where Christ is going to take you. He's going to take you to present you to God as a people who are holy. Well, there are a couple of things that we need to look at here. In the first place, uh, Paul reminds us about how we are indeed we are reconciled with God. He says, it is with Christ's physical body through death. 
Literally, he speaks about Christ's body of flesh. <coughs> and so Paul combines two words, body and flesh. And in this way, he stresses that Christ really is a human being, just like we are human beings. If you take a look earlier in this, cha in this, in this chapter, in verse 15, uh, though you'll notice that, that Paul says that Jesus is the image, he's the image of the invisible God. That means that the Lord God, Paul says, has become visible to us here in this world through his Son. Jesus Christ came and he dwelt among us in our human body. And it is in uh, this body of flesh uh, that Christ has come in order that he might make the great payment for all of our sins. In that body of flesh, he became the firstborn from among the dead for dying in his real physical body. He has paid for our sins. But he didn't just die. His body is not just resting in the grave somewhere, but he also rose up with that physical body. And so he has also then overcome death in this world. And by his bodily resurrection, then the Lord Jesus has now opened the way for his people, for us, into eternal life. And so that's how Christ now reconciles us to God. It's through the sacrifice he gave with his real physical body. But what was his goal? Because once Christ has reconciled us, then that's not the end of the matter. There's certainly, surely there has to be more than that. And Paul says, well, his goal then was this, that he might present us wholly in God's sight. Well, here to present has the idea of, of bringing someone before a judge. And so Christ's goal is, is to present us before the great judge in heaven as a people who are holy, that is, a people who are without any sin and without any guilt. And when we stand before God being holy, this isn't our holiness, but this is the holiness that has been given to us by the Lord Jesus Christ through his physical body. It is through the blood that he has shed that Christ has paid for all of my sins, that he's removed also the guilt of sin from my life. And therefore the Lord God is the great judge on that day will then also declare us, he says, you are, you are innocent, you are without any guilt. For your sins have been paid for by the blood of Jesus. Paul also says that Christ will present us as a people before God who is without any blemish. Well, you know that this word blemish is often used in the Old Testament in, in connection with the, the animals that were sacrificed to the Lord uh, God. And so before any animal was sacrificed on the altar in the Old Testament, the priest would first of all look at the animal, inspect the animal very carefully uh, to, to make sure that there were no broken bones, that there were no physical blemishes, that the animal was an animal that was limping, or that there was anything else that might be wrong with the animal. Why? Because that animal had to be perfect in order that it might be also accepted by the holy God. And so Paul says, he says, you know what, Christ's goal is that he might present us as God's people without any moral blemishes. As people who are completely perfect, without sin, without any corruption, without any evil within us. Now, of course, when you think about that, then we also know, beloved, that today we're not yet perfect. We see our own sins, our own struggles, our own battles. We see also the blemishes of sin and evil in so many aspects of our lives, even those that are still lived there in, in our thoughts and our minds. But, what, but Paul says what, what Christ does is he washes us clean with his blood. He washes away every blemish. He removes every stain of sin so that when we appear before the throne of God, we will appear perfect in the sight of our Lord. And Christ, he says, will also present us to the Father free from accusation. That means that when we stand before the, whole, before the judge in heaven, there will be no one who can bring any accusation of wrongdoing, of evil, of corruption, or of sin against us, no matter what we may, what we may have done here in this life. Well, what does Paul talk here about free from accusation? Well, because we know that we have a great enemy who's the devil. And the devil is often referred to in the scriptures as a great accuser. 
And so what does the devil try to do? Well, the devil stands there before the throne of God and he attempts to bring accusations against us. And on the one hand, you can say, you know, those accusations are accurate. He has a lot of ammunition. But yet, Paul says, but when, Christ, when the devil comes and brings those accusations of sin and evil against you, none of his accusations will be able to stick. They will all be brushed aside. Why? Because Christ has removed every accusation from your life because of his sacrifice on the cross. So that in the face of every accusation that the devil might even bring, Christ will declare that this one is innocent because I have washed him, I have washed her clean from all their guilt and their sin. And so Paul says, my fellow believers, my brothers, my sisters in Colossae, this is where you are in the scheme of Christ's work of salvation. You are today, you are now reconciled with God. Now that you know that you are reconciled with the Almighty, now you can also see where your life is going. Now you can see that Christ is leading your life to his goal, and that is that he might present you to the Father as holy, without blemish, of any sin, free from every accusation of wrongdoing. And so, my fellow believers, don't return back to that old way of life. Don't fall back into the life in which you once were alienated from God and your enemies of the Lord in your minds. Remember that message was so important for the believers in Colossae because of the danger in which they were and falling away and turning their back on God and on Christ. But that message, beloved, is just as important and valuable for you today. For Christ comes, and, and he also speaks to us today, and he says, I have reconciled you with God through my sacrifice on the cross. And therefore, beloved, you also need to, to see where you are then on that, that map of Christ's work of salvation. You need to also see in your life that you too are a people who have been reconciled with, Christ, or with God through the blood of Christ. And when you see that, then you can also see on that map of Christ's work of salvation uh, where you are going. Then you also know that, that the Lord Jesus Christ is, is directing you to that day when he, when he will present you before his Father in heaven as a holy people. He presents you as people who are without any blemish of sin, that you are free from any accusation of wrongdoing. That's the incredible gospel message. And he'll do that for you. Not because any of us, beloved, are worthy of that. But he will do that. Why? Because in his grace and his mercy, he has washed us clean from all of our sin. He's taken away our guilt by his blood. And therefore, also the warning of our text is important. That we do not then turn back to that life in which we were alienated from God. We were enemies of God in our minds. But beloved, that each day that you walk with Christ, as we look forward also to the future, for Christ's goal is to present us without blemish, free from accusation. And that goal, Paul says, will be reached on that day when he returns from heaven. But the question then is, how will Christ reach that goal for our lives? Well, Paul says the goal will be achieved, if you continue on in the text, if you in continue, if you continue in your faith. So that was an important message for the believers in Colossae because, as we said, they're in danger of leaving the faith by following false teachers who appear to have denied the, the supremacy of the Lord Jesus for the life of the believer. And Paul says if you continue on that path going backwards, uh, then you will miss the goal that Christ has for your life. And so what you have here, beloved, is this call to persevere in the faith every day. Well, then you ask, so what is this faith that Paul is talking about? Well, Paul is, is thinking, verse 23, he's thinking about the hope that he says is held out in the gospel. The gospel that you heard, he says, and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. You see, beloved, when, when Paul speaks about faith, 
and thinking about the hope that we have for the future. This hope is the hope that is given to us in the gospel, he says. And he also says this gospel is the good news of life and salvation in Jesus Christ. This gospel, beloved, is God's promise that for the sake of the Lord Jesus' death on the cross, through his great victory in the resurrection, God will no longer hold your sins against you. And so remember then how God, or how Paul began by reminding us, yes, we were alienated from God. One time we were enemies of the Lord in our minds because of our evil and our rebellious behavior. Being alienated from God means that you were living under the eternal wrath, under the eternal anger of God, without any hope in this world at all. Remember how one time your future, your future was dark and it was miserable? For the only thing that awaited, all of, that awaited you and all of mankind is, is your eternal destruction and descent into hell. But God came. God came to the world with his gospel. And in that gospel, God promised that for the sake of his son, Jesus Christ, he promised you, I will forgive you your sins if you turn to me in faith. God's promise is that everyone who trusts in the Lord Jesus will be delivered from a life of hopelessness. And they will enter into a life of glorious hope. <clears throat> All those who turn to the Lord Jesus, Jesus says in, to Nicodemus in John 3, verse 16, will not perish but have eternal life. That's the hope, Paul says, that, that is held out in the gospel. And this gospel, he says, you have heard, has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven. In other words, God's promise, beloved, is being preached to the whole world so that all of mankind is called to turn to the Lord Jesus in faith and repentance. Well, Paul says to the believers, you heard the gospel. You heard all those wonderful promises from God. So now why? Why are you in danger of letting go of those promises? Those promises that alone gives you the hope for your future. Therefore, my brothers, my sisters, continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope that the Lord has given to you. To establish means that this, is the, that this hope is the foundation on which they need to build their lives. And when he says firm, he means sitting firm. It means that you're not constantly shifting from one idea to another idea. You're all over the spiritual map. But that you hold on to the hope of the gospel that you have in Christ Jesus. Don't let go of it, he says. Well, beloved, this message also resonates for us today. So that we also need to ask ourselves personally, where am I on this map of life? Do you perhaps find yourself all over the map? Not secure in your faith, not secure in, in where you are going. So that you no longer know where you are on that spiritual map. And if you don't know where you are, then you don't have any comfort either. You have no security in your heart. Well, here in this text, the Apostle Paul wants to reorient the believers so that they can again find their place on the map. We constantly need to remember, beloved, where we are on the map of Christ's salvation. As God's people, Paul says, you're here. Namely, you have now been reconciled by Jesus Christ. That's where you are in this life. Remember, once you were alienated without any hope, but now you've been reconciled and you've been brought into that living relationship with the Lord God Almighty through the Lord Jesus. And therefore, he says, you can also now see where you are going on that spiritual map. Now you can see the goal to which you are traveling, for we have the hope that Christ will present us one day to his Father, his people who are holy, that is without any blemish, free from every accusation of sin. Beloved, now you can also see clearly where you are headed on that spiritual map. We're headed for that day when the Lord Jesus will take us into eternal glory. And therefore, also the warning, but also the encouragement that Paul gives is, and therefore continue on in your faith, established and firm in the hope that the Lord God gives you 
Never move from the hope that you have received in this gospel. For in Christ Jesus, you now have the life everlasting. Amen. Amen.